Well, last time we met with Mr. Joseph, he had just been thrown into prison in chapter 39 for allegedly making a move on Potiphar's wife, and so he ended up in prison. But like we saw at the end of chapter 39, like everything else that he's been involved in, wherever Joseph was, God was with him, God blessed his work, and he was a success. And then we get into chapter 40 and see more about the hand of God in Joseph's life and about how God used him in prison. And uh, just basically just continue to be with him. Chapter 41, we'll get into the, one of the, if anybody ever doubts the sovereignty of God, chapter 41 is proof that God is sovereign. And so it's one of the best chapters in the, the Bible about the sovereignty of God. But chapter 40, we'll read this. And it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them, and they were in confinement for some time. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? And they said to him, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches, and it was budding, its blossoms came out, and clusters clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I've done nothing that should have put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. In the top basket, there were some of all sorts of the baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph, Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat eat your flesh off of you. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all of his servants. He lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker amongst his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer of his to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hands but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had interpreted to them yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him one thing as we've been studying about Joseph's life and all the ups and downs the horrible things that have happened to him being sold into slavery being by his own brothers being bought as a slave by Potiphar, being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and now being in prison for something he didn't do. There's one thing we need to note, and it's real obvious, is that Joseph never gave up on God. Throughout all of his difficulties, throughout all of his hardships, his faith in God, as far as we know, what the Bible tells us, never wavered. 
He had absolute confidence that God was with him. God was going to take care of him. He didn't have a clue as to how God was going to do it, but he had confidence that God was with him. And uh, throughout of that, through all of that, his attitude and confidence in God just is shockingly positive. Now, this man could have had a great big pity party. He could have gotten mad at God, angry at God for his circumstances, but he didn't. He hung on, and God encouraged him and sustained him throughout all these ordeals. One of the things we can learn as we study the life of Joseph is that you and I go through the same ups and downs. Where we may not be thrown into prison, our brothers may not sell us into slavery, we still have ups and downs that are traumatic in our lives. And the thing we need to do is to look at his life and have the confidence that God is with us no matter what's going on. No matter where we end up, what situation we're in, what location we may be in, that God is with us. And we need to have confidence and faith in him just as Joseph did. Now, as you get into this chapter, you start seeing there's, he's in prison. It's a far cry from living in Potiphar's house. It's probably a far cry from living at his dad's house. He's in prison. Uh, it was probably a prison that Potiphar himself ran, supervised at, at most, at least. And uh, there would be an influx of people in and out of this prison. And here we see that uh, two guys show up, two unique men come to be inmates with Joseph. Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's royal baker, or chief baker. A cupbearer is a very prestigious position in, at that time in the courts. As the cupbearer not only was the one that tasted wine and other things for Pharaoh to make sure they weren't poisonous, he was also the guard, chief guard for Pharaoh's bed or sleeping quarters. So a very prestigious position, someone that's usually very close to the Pharaoh or king, whatever it may be. Now there's a more famous cupbearer in the Old Testament. Anybody remember him? Nehemiah. So this is, we learned a lot about it from Nehemiah. We know this is a very prestigious uh, position. And uh, the royal baker was a position not probably quite as close as the cupbearer, but still a very important figure in the royal court, so to speak. And while we are not told what they did to infuriate Pharaoh to the point of having them put in prison, we can conclude that it was a ser serious enough offense that it really got Pharaoh going. And so they're in prison. And as they're in prison, Joseph befriended them, befriended them enough to the point that one morning he gets up and starts to make his rounds or whatever he did, sees them, sees they look dejected, and <clears throat> asks them what the problem was. Why do you look dejected today? And then they start telling about their dreams. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> just ate a sandwich. The detail of the dreams are really pretty simple. The cupbearer dreams about grapes, about the grapevine that produced ripe grapes, and Pharaoh, he has Pharaoh's cup, squeezed the grapes, grape juice went in the cup, and he was able to give the cup to Pharaoh. <coughs> Joseph tells him that in three days, Pharaoh would restore him to his position. And so the chief baker hears this, and he says, not a bad interpretation, guys. What, did, what about my dream? Well, his dream's interpretation was a little bit different. As Joseph, as Joseph explains to him that he saw three baskets on his head, all types of baked goods, birds were eating out of the baskets, and Joseph's interpretation was in three days, Pharaoh's going to cut off your head and hang your body, and the birds are going to eat your flesh. There's one thing to note as he interprets his dreams is who does he give credit for being able to interpret dreams? God. Again, Joseph's in a position where he could have really said, hey, let me do this. Listen to me. Listen to my interpretation. But he gives God the credit and it depends upon God for these. And the con chapter concludes basically with three days later, both interpretations of these dreams come true. The baker was executed, the cupbearer was restored, and 
where Joseph had asked the cupbearer to remember me to Pharaoh because I'm in here, I've been falsely accused, I'm a Hebrew, I'm not supposed to be in Egypt, remember me when you get to Pharaoh. And we're told the cupbearer forgets all about him as soon as he gets out. And he remains in prison. Now, a pretty short chapter. There's some application points in here for us. And we'll spend more time in chapter 41 tonight because it's a lot longer chapter. A lot more stuff in it. But one of the things we need to understand about this and take away from this chapter is that God allows us to go through trials, sometimes painful trials, through no, due to no fault of our own, and he uses these to help us grow and mature in Christ. Now, there's a classic example of this in the Old Testament of a guy that uh, God let him go through the trials before he was able to do what God wanted him to do, and that was Moses. And you think about the life of Moses. Growing up in Pharaoh's court, being educated, having the lush and spoils of Egypt before him. And then he takes matters into his own hands, saying, I'm supposed to be the liberator of the Hebrews, kills an Egyptian, and runs away and hides in the desert. Hides in the desert for 40 years, tending the most ignorant animals that God ever made, his sheep. If you've ever been around sheep, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've only had three sheep in my life, and uh, some missionaries, some British missionaries, I don't know how they ended up with them, but they lived in town, didn't have any place to keep them. We lived out in the country, had a 200-acre farm in Tanzania, and they gave us these sheep. Every time you turned your back on the ram, he came after you, and he would hit you hard. I kicked that sheep in the head so many times trying to keep him away from me or after the fact. <laughs> but I did learn to shear sheep because their wool got long and we didn't have electric, of course, we didn't have electricity. So we had just hand clippers. Hand and why I took sheep shears with me, I don't know. But I had sheep shears. And so I clipped those sheep and gave the wool to the people that gave the sheep to us. And I don't know what she did with it. It was nasty and oily. You know, they have lanolin in their wool. And so it was, I don't know what she did with it. She didn't make me anything, which I'm glad. The sheep didn't last long. But, I mean, Fa uh, Moses is a great example of someone that had, had it all going, and then God had a different purpose for him, and it took 40 years of Moses tending sheep on the backside of nowhere before God shows up in a burning bush. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, David is another good example. Samuel had, a, had anointed David king, and for the next several years, he ran for his life as King Saul tried to have him killed. And so... As we encounter these trials that God leads us into as we go through following him, God can use these trials to help us mature as, as Christians and as people. Sometimes we just need to grow up. Grow up and stop acting childish. Um, we saw Joseph grow up from being a self-centered um, obnoxious kid who had a cool coat to where now he's a very responsible man that's taken care of various things in prison, had taken care of various things in Potiphar's house, and he had grown up. And that's what a lot of us need to do, what a lot of Christians need to do. We just need to grow up emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Uh, one of the things we need to stop doing to grow up spiritually is living by our emotions. Because people can be having a bad day and they get mad at God and everything else, forget about God and walk off. Folks, God's with us and he's going to be with us. Good days, bad days. Don't let your emotions be your driver. 
and just continue to trust him and mature as a Christian. For some, that may, need, mean, may mean that they need to start reading their Bible more. They need to start praying more. They need to have a quiet time. They need to be going to church. They need to be in Bible studies. Some, it may mean that they need to go to a, a college uh, and study the Bible or a seminary and get degrees. Whatever it is, we need to grow up and allow our faith and confidence in God to grow. And God uses trials oftentimes to mature us and to prepare us for his purposes. And sometimes God uses trials to point out areas in our lives that he wants us to give up. Now, a lot of times these are little pet sins that you and I love to do, but we're reluctant to confess and even more reluctant to let go of. And God wants us to let go. God wants us to confess these, deal with these, and live the way that he wants us to. And sometimes these things could also be nothing wrong with it. Perfectly good things. But it's not what God wants. God wants the best, not the good for us. And the enemy of the, good, enemy of the best is always the good. So don't settle. Let God bring out the best. He also uses trials to help us be empathetic to other people. Just as Joseph was empathetic to the cupbearer and the chief baker, sometimes our trials make us more empathetic to other people that are going through sorrow and pain, tough times. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you that I do not have one smidgen, one smidgen of the gift of mercy in my body. That is not what God equipped me to do. I have compassion, but if you want me to sit and cry with you, that ain't happening. That's just not the way God wired me. Ask my wife. She'll say, nope, no mercy. Compassion, no mercy. And a lot of times, God, and God has led me into some areas that has made me very compassionate and empathetic with people that are going through different things. And so I can do that. I may not be able to show the mercy that someone that has the gift of mercy can, but I can be sympathetic. I can be empathetic and compassionate. So God may have wired you to be able to minister to people that have different hurts, one of the little sayings that Celebrate, Reu- Celebrate Recovery uses, one of the phrases, is it's for life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And so you may be equipped to deal with people who have gone through life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups better than other people. So going through these sometimes makes us more empathetic to other people. Another thing trials can do in our lives is God can use these to humble us. And you've all ever been humbled by God? Have a time or two. Don't know that I want to do it again. But being humble from God is part of the process we go through of maturity. His trials have a way of making us realize our own weaknesses, our own abilities. And... Um, that we need him to deal with situations that we encounter, making us more dependent upon him. And uh, one of the biggest enemies that we face in our attempt to be humility is our own pride. Because we want to be very self-sufficient and we don't need anybody. But God wants us to depend upon him and be supported by him in whatever we go through and the last point just to reiterate is that God wants us to remain to learn from Joseph and to stand firm in adversity all right quick short chapter 41 is a little bit longer 42 is more long as we'll get to 42 next week the 41 is a long chapter 57 verses Y'all want me to read it? Say yes or no. Yes? Okay. Y'all like to listen to my Texas accent, I take it. (laughs) 
Now, it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, the seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of our own dream, his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was there, was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one, he interpreted according to his own dream. And just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he, he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, but no one can interpret it. I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. And behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor, very ugly, and gaunt, such as I had never seen for the ugliness in all of Egypt, all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it did not, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dreams, a dream, behold, seven ears full full and good came up on a single stalk, and lo, seven ears withered, thin, and scorched by east winds sprouting up after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. Then I told the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I've spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance of the forgot- will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the, that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now as for repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise enough, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land, and let them exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming, store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority, and let them guard it. Let the food become a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now 
the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all to all of his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this who, who, in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house according to your command. All my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I'm Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zaphonath Paneah, and he gave Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth, forth over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, went throughout, through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, because it was beyond, for it was beyond measure. Now before the year of the famine came, before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. When the seven years of plenty had been in the land of Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said, then there was famine in all the lands. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine had spread all over the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. Oh, might need a drink after that one. One of the things we need to remember, we talked about this a little bit, but we're going to just refresh everybody, is uh, we talked about the Egyptian culture and their pagan worship. Part of this pagan worship they practice dreams were a big, big part of their worship experience. Magicians and soothsayers abounded in their society as professional interpreters of dreams. The discussion and meaning of dreams were very important, and these interpreters of dreams were held in high esteem. We also must remember that a few years back, Joseph had had a couple of dreams himself about how his brothers and his family bowed down to him. And we talked about this as well, that in our world today, God primarily speaks to us through his Bible, through his word, and through his Holy Spirit. But in parts of the world where Christianity is either being persecuted or outlawed, there are stories of people who still have dreams, some type of dream involving Jesus, and this leads them to a point of accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is especially true in the Islamic cultures around the world today. All right, we get into Pharaoh's dreams, verses 1 through 8, and uh, these dreams really upset him. And I can understand why, because you don't have dreams where cows eat cows and heads of grain eat heads of grain. So he was really disturbed at this. And so he summoned all of the wise men of the kingdom 
the magicians, the soothsayers, the guys that said they could interpret dreams, and yet no one could interpret these dreams. Now, I'm sure that really set well with him. I'm sure he just went completely ballistic on these guys for not being able to tell him what the dreams meant. But then his cupbearer remembered he had a dream once too. And it was this young man in prison with him, a Hebrew that had correctly interpreted his dream and the dream of the chief baker. And so he tells Pharaoh about this kid, this young man. And so Pharaoh's ready to try anything because he's really upset about these dreams. And so he sends for Joseph to be released from prison. Now Joseph's life is about to hit light speed at how fast things change. And the accelerator, the throttle, whatever you want to say, is about to be pushed way forward, and he is about to experience the speed and things that he never even dreamed of about to happen. So Joseph's released from prison. He's cleaned up and brought to Pharaoh. An interesting tidbit that's important is he had to shave. Egyptians at this time did not wear beards. Hebrews did. So he had to look like an Egyptian as much as he could to appear before Pharaoh. Another interesting thing to note is this is the third time that Joseph has had to give up his clothes and got a new set of clothes. So just a little interesting things. His dialogue with Pharaoh is interesting as he gives God credit, credit to God and God alone is the only one who can interpret dreams. Now again, how easy would it have been for him to say, let me tell you what this means. But he didn't. He wasn't after his own fame. He was after honoring God and knew that that was the only way that he could interpret these dreams. And he tells that Pharaoh, he tell, begins with telling Pharaoh that God had revealed, his, revealed to him the dreams of the future events that were going to happen quickly, and Pharaoh better pay attention. And if you think about this, here's this young man, Hebrew, talking to Pharaoh, and in their culture, he's a god himself. And he's telling this guy that's supposedly God, you can't interpret your own dream, you're not really a god. But my god can interpret your dream. And part of that, too, is Joseph doesn't want Pharaoh to trust in him. He wants Pharaoh to hear and to trust in what God's going to, to do. So he tells Joseph the dreams, and immediately Joseph provides the interpretation. The interpretation of the dreams are dramatic. There will be seven years of abundance to the point of excess. And there would be a famine that would wipe out all the abundance. Then in boldness, he suggests to Pharaoh a plan of what they should do for the next 14 years. And God moved Pharaoh to choose Joseph to be the leader of this plan of action. And he made Joseph number two man in all of Egypt, gave him his signet ring, which was full authority of Pharaoh, put a gold chain around him, gave him a new cloak, and then put at his disposal his second chariot. And when Joseph ran around, there were people that ran ahead of the chariot saying the Hebrew or Egyptian word is a brek. Some of your Bibles may have that in there. Uh, they're not real sure what it means. In Egyptian, they believe it's att attention. And in Hebrew, they believe it is bow the knee. Either way, people would know that Joseph was coming if it, no, it was someone important coming down the road wherever Joseph went. How fast can life change? From the prison to being the number two guy in all of Egypt. Wow. And then we see that Pharaoh gave him a new name, an Egyptian name, Zaphineth Panea. I'm sure I'm not saying that right because if I see any type of foreign language, I pronounce it like you would in Swahili because that's the foreign language I know or knew. And so I'm sure it's not right, but it's pretty close. And that means God speaks. He lives. And then he gave him a wife. 
a lady named Asenath, who was the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. On was one of the four great cities of ancient Egypt, dedicated to the sun god Ra. And why did Pharaoh give him a, a priestess, a priest daughter for his wife? Pharaoh was a very savvy politician. He knew that David, they, uh, Joseph having an in with the priesthood in Egypt would only be good for him because they were a very powerful group and having a wife from this particular priest would only strengthen his position in the land. Then you get down to verse 46, and we notice that Joseph is 30 years old. He was 17 when he was sold into slavery, so he's been in Egypt for 13 years. Been away from his family for 13 years. And Joseph being 30 years old, I don't know if you've thought about this, but it kind of hit me when I was studying this, kind of reminds me of Jesus. How old was Jesus when he started his public ministry? 30. Similar, there are similarities between Joseph and Jesus' life, but the main one to note is where Joseph's work saved Egypt, saved his family, saved the Israel uh, Hebrew na race. Jesus' work offered salvation for the entire world. Joseph's plan for gathering the abundance during the, the se during the seven years' work that he had warehouses built and placed in the strategic areas of the country in the major cities of Egypt. Now the harvest was so great that they quit counting. The Egyptians by culture are meticulous counters. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But the harvest is so great, nobody wanted to count all the bushels of grain that were being harvested. We were told the amount was greater than sand on the seashore. We also note that Joseph and his bride were fruitful as she bore him two sons during this time. The first was, as we said, is Manasseh, which means God made me forget all my hardships in my father's house. Joseph was a man of great accomplishment during this time, a man of unwavering faith in God, but perhaps his greatest accomplishment at this time was he was able to put the past behind him. He was able to forgive his brothers and move forward. And God blessed him with the ability to wipe out the pains and the bad memories and to make a new beginning. And he put the past where it needed to be in the past. His, first, his firstborn son's name signifies this. His secondborn son named Ephraim, which means God made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Again, God is, J Joseph is giving God credit for blessing him while he's there. The seven years of abundance come to an end, and the seven years of famine start. And I hope you notice that this wasn't just a famine in Egypt. The Bible says it was a famine over all the earth. But because of Joseph's plan, the Bible says there was food and grain for the Egyptians, and the entire world came to Egypt for food. God not only used Joseph to save the Egyptians, as we will see in chapters coming up, he was able to save his father, his brothers, their families, and thus the entire race of Israel. Okay. <sighs> Applications. First and foremost, as we said when we started, this chapter is one of the key chapters in proving the sovereignty of God. We've talked a lot about the sovereignty of God as we went through Revelation. We've talked about the sovereignty of God as we've been in this study. But this particular chapter and how God engineered Joseph's circumstances to get him to this point shows just how sovereign God is. And how God moved in Pharaoh's life via dreams to embrace Joseph, to be the one that would lead and deliver Egypt. And if you think about your own life and look back, how many of us can look back and see the twists and turns that our lives have taken? And from this side, looking back, we can see the hand of God as we made those twists and turns. 
in my own life, it's incredible how I ended up here in this church. And I'm blessed to be a part of it, blessed to be a part of the ministries that I have been a part of, and blessed to be a part of the ministries of this church. Folks, Romans 8, Romans 8, 28 is true. All things do work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. We just need to embrace that. God is sovereign. And we can have confidence in him, full confidence in him. Second point is sometimes you have to hang on to your faith as you wait on God. We've talked about waiting on God before but in this chapter we see joseph having to wait he waited two years from the time the cupbearer was released until he was told pharaoh hey there's this kid back in prison i can imagine as the cupbearer was released joseph was filled with hope with possible excitement that finally someone was going to hear about his case after all he shouldn't be in egypt he's a hebrew he shouldn't be in prison because Potiphar's wife lied. Surely Pharaoh would hear this and release him from prison. But as the days went by, as the weeks went by, as the months went by, I'm sure that hope kind of faded, diminished. May have even gone away. But what God was doing during this time in his life, he was testing him. Would Joseph remain faithful in doing what God had asked him to do while he was in prison? Yes, he did. And so, you have to ask, did he believe that the dreams that he had as a teenager, were they just dreams or were they visions of the future? Waiting on God is not easy. It's probably one of the more difficult things we do. And we're guilty of God, uh, we are guilty of God wanting to show us every step of the journey before we ever start the journey. One of the things I used to love to do was look at maps. Any of y'all ever looked, like to look at maps? You know the paper things we used to have? The books, the atlases, and stuff like that? I used to, when I was a kid, my, before my dad passed, we'd take a big trip every summer. We'd go to from Texas to Glacier, Yellowstone, D.C., Virginia, Florida. I always had a map. And so I loved to read maps and loved to look at maps. And having one on my phone is great, but it's not the same. It's having a map. Right after we moved here, I went and bought a map. Because, you know, you can't just see this much of Nevada on your phone. Well... The problem we have is we want God to pull out that big map before we ever start on a journey with him. We want him to show, okay, here's starting point. There's the ending point. We want the quickest way through there, a straight line. But that's not how God works. Rarely, rarely, if ever, is it a straight line. It's going to be a meandering line with all kinds of perils, with all kinds of difficulties, trials. And praying for patience as we wait on God is a must. Praying for courage as we wait on God is a must. Being faithful to Him while we wait on Him is not easy at times. But the one thing that I learned a long time ago about waiting on God and waiting for the next opportunity to open up is while you wait, be doing what he asked you to do when you got to the point of waiting. Keep doing what he has you doing. Waiting on God is not an excuse for inactivity, laziness, or indecisiveness. I wish I could tell you that I've never known a person, a Christian, that didn't see waiting on God as an opportunity to be indecisive or lazy. Known a few of them. As one of the administrators of our mission in Tanzania, I was in charge of the business side of it. 
And every year we'd ask the missionaries for business plans or ministry plans, you know, similar things along with their budgets and things that they asked we could supply them. And we had a couple of people. They were good people. What's your business plan? I'm going to pray. Okay, that's great. What are you going to do next? I ain't doing nothing until God tells me what to do. So you're not even going to do what you're supposed to be doing anyway until God tells you the next thing to do. Nope, we're just going to sit in the house and pray. And that's what they did. Morning to slap them upside the head. Needless to say, when it came time to approve their budgets, they didn't get too much money. But they didn't last long on Mr. Bill. Uh, Another thing to think about as we wait on God and we can think, look at the Bible and think of other people who had to wait on God's timing. And the guy that jumped to my mind first was Job. Job had everything, was a righteous man, blessed beyond measure. And Satan asked God for the, for the right to test Job. And God gave Job, Satan the right to test Job. And testing is an understatement for what he did to Job. But after Job lost his home, lost all of his animals, lost his family, lost his children, and their wives, Job 2, chapter, nine, uh, Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, his wife was still there. And she said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept the good from God and not the trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. We need to learn to wait on God like Job did. Cursing God is not the right response. For Joseph, as he waited on God, he apparently did not sin, nor did he lose his faith in God. We saw demonstrated when he saw it, stood before Pharaoh telling Pharaoh that only God could give interpretations to dreams. He stood firm. Just a few side thoughts, and like I've told you, I've studied this, that word wait, waiting in the Bible when I was many, many years ago because I was a very impatient person. And uh, God just didn't happen fast enough, move fast enough, so I had to be humbled and learn to wait on God. Uh, patiently waiting on God can strengthen our confidence in God without reducing our self-confidence to continue in the place he has us. Keep doing what you're doing. A period of waiting can oftentimes lead us to develop more character and to reflect that character to other people. Also, there are things that we cannot learn apart from a, waiting, from a period of waiting and oftentimes that period of waiting must come in the context of trials and adversity. Kind of a refined by fire, so to speak. Periods of waiting create opportunities for advancement for the kingdom that may not otherwise come. And God's, you need to always remember this. God's timing is always perfect. He's never slow. He's never early. But our tendency is to get in a hurry. Another thing about the application of this text tonight is God is not the author of confusion. In this case, Pharaoh's dreams were uninterpretable by everyone in Egypt except for this young Hebrew man who was in prison. Pharaoh could have easily dismissed the idea of having a Hebrew interpret his dreams, but he didn't. He humbled himself to the point of saying, this is how disturbed this man was by these dreams. He humbled himself to the point of saying, let the Hebrew come tell me what my dreams mean. For us, we can be assured that when God speaks, he makes it possible for us to understand. As we said, he gives us his word, his Holy Spirit, as well as gifted teachers and preachers to help us understand. He has promised that all who seek him will find him when they seek him with all their heart. The fourth point is God's word is always given with a view towards action. However it's given to us is always meant to be acted upon. In Pharaoh's case, 
Pharaoh was given the opportunity to act on what Joseph had told him God had revealed to him. Pharaoh could have blown it off. He said, no, I don't think so. But Pharaoh acted upon what Joseph had told him God had revealed to him. In like manner, when we hear God's word, we're expected to act upon it, whether it's applying its precepts to our lives, confessing sins, or doing what God is asking us to join him in doing. One of the greatest dangers as Christians today is not a lack of knowledge about the Bible, but rather a failure to act upon what we know. You realize most of us in this room have lived long enough to be called more experienced people on this planet. Believe it or not, the boomer generation, which I'm a boomer, is the last biblically literate generation on the planet today. As a group of people, we are biblically literate. The Gen Xers behind us, the Millennials behind them, and Gen Zs behind them are not. That's why when you hear Calvin talk about running into people, they don't have a clue what John 3.16 is in this town. It's true. It's not just in Las Vegas. It's across the country. It's in the Bible Belt. It's even in Texas if Texas is the Bible Belt. But there's not a problem for us as a group with knowledge. The problem is applying and doing what the Bible tells us to do. Now there's hope. Some of the younger generations are starting to wake up and realize the need for faith. Just read an article this last week that said the Gen Z men, the young men are turning to the faith faster than the girls are, which is just the opposite of the way it usually happens. There's hope. So, we've got to apply what we know. And the fifth thing is like Joseph, we need to learn to be faithful when things are bad, but also. When things are good. We talked about this before a couple of three or four times is it's easy to be a, a good Christian when things are going bad for you. It's harder to really be a devout Christian when things are going good. We tend to let it slide and we aren't as dependent upon God when things are going good. And in Joseph, we also see a picture of Jesus. We talked about that briefly and just the similarities that, uh, Both men have. They both were betrayed. Both were sold for silver. Both were men God spoke through. Both were thrown into a pit or jail. Both experienced suffering, humiliation before being exalted. Joseph, the number two position in all of Egypt. Jesus to the King of Kings, the Lord is Lords. Number seven, some of us have come to a point in life's journey when we can look back on our lives and see the distinct hand of God at working in our lives. We mentioned that briefly. Won't dwell on that. And then the last thought I'd like to leave with you is some of us are here, all of us are here for such a time as this. In the book of Esther, Esther is a Jewish woman who became queen in a pagan country. There were powerful enemies in this country against the Jewish people. One man in particular, a man named Haman, was very anti-Jewish. He gained great favor with the king, and the king allowed him to, gave him orders, or allowed him the, the, the wish, whatever, to go through the country and eliminate all the Jews. Problem is, Esther was queen, and she's a Jew. Esther's uncle, a man named Mordecai, a righteous man, convinced her to use her relationship with the king to prevent the slaughter of the Jewish people. He asked her in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, And who knows, but you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. 
Folks, it's not by accident that any one of us are here. Living in Henderson, Las Vegas, Clark County, United States of America, we're all here by God's appointment, God's plan. We're all here for such a time as this, to make a difference here in Clark County, to make a difference in this church, to make a difference in all the people that live here that need to hear and know about Jesus Christ. We're here for such a time as this. The question each one of us has to answer is whether or not we will allow God to use us for his purposes in the world around us.